any, anything that's kind of coming in. We don't have to keep it for a long time. We can play with it for a month and then, you know, get rid of it and what else is coming uh, that we can use that's going to be around for a month. So we're kind of doing shorter menu changes and using the, the produce that's in season and available now at, at its best. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. There are moments in one's life that have a profound impact that can change the course, lead you down a new path and into a world you may not have expected. Food can have the power to change people and also drive them to success too. Hamish Ingham is the co-owner and chef of Tequila Daisy and Redbird Chinese. Hamish, how are you? Yeah, not too bad. Yourself? I'm good. It's good to get you on the show. It's been a little while. Finally. (laughs) (laughs) It's been a little while since we've actually seen each other and uh, you've changed a lot in the restaurant world. Um, How are things going? Yeah, look, not too bad. Look, yeah, I mean, it's it's a bit of a tough year, to be honest, at the moment. You know, we've got through COVID. You know, we, everyone got through COVID and we're, th- you know, you think it's all rosy, but, you know, it's still, it's still, you know, it's still not easy out there. You've, you've had some um, changes of, uh, in recent years, turning uh, Banksy into Tequila Daisy and obviously opening Redbird Chinese in Redfern as well. Um, tell us a bit about both of them. Yeah, look, um, Banksy, we had Banksy since two, when it opened in 2016. Uh, so five, five years later, you know, it was going great guns. Um, and we just thought it was time to change. The dem- demographic down at Barangaroo had kind of changed. Uh, people had changed. Customers had changed. Uh, the crown was kind of coming up and uh, almost being finished. Um, and, you know, quite a few high-end restaurants in there. So we just, yeah, we just got through COVID and thought it was, you know, time to change, um, uh, time to change it, change it around into something new and fresh. Yeah, it's and it's been successful since. It operates a bit differently. Tell, tell us a bit about what you're doing there. Yeah, look, so we, we changed it into a modern Mexican restaurant. Um, it, yeah, it just it's kind of suited the demographic a bit down there a bit more, uh, a bit more flexible. You know, we've got an a inside bar where people can just come and drop in and have tacos and have a, have a margarita before their ferry. Uh, and then, we've, you know, the, the, the dining terrace is still there. So that's, you know, fully serviced, you know, full wine list, uh, all, all of those uh, bits. So you can come for a sit-down lunch or just a drop-in, really. Yeah, and it's it's actually you know it's worked really well. I, it was just yeah, it was just one of those things. We're like, well, what do we do? Do we keep uh, Banksy going uh, for a bit longer? But it was doing really well. But it was just kind of looking at the demographic and where the business was headed uh, into the future. It was just kind of like, oh, what do we do? I think you know, I think we made the right decision. And kind of coming out of COVID, we we actually had three other business partners in the business as well. Um, so we it was time to sign up a new lease with uh, our landlord uh, and the other business partners kind of wanted to they were get they were nervous through COVID obviously and kind of wanted out so we yeah so we ended up buying them out and uh, owned the business ourselves and flipped it to a Mexican restaurant which I'd never done Mexican cuisine before but yeah it was kind of a it was a, a win win really at the end of COVID. Well, speaking of the demographic that's down there, it's an entirely different one in, in Redfern where you've lent into your sort of um, book of tricks, which is you're very familiar with Chinese cuisine. Tell us a bit about Redbird. Yeah, look, uh, Rebecca and I live in Redfern, so uh, we always, you know, want to go out on the weekend or uh, day off uh, around the area, you know, because we want to kind of support local. Uh, and we had been eyeing off the site on Redfern Street for a little while since we moved in because it was kind of nothing really happening with the venue and it wasn't, you know, going that well. So we literally, Rebecca literally contacted them via Facebook Messenger <laughs> and said, we want your site. Can you please can you please give it to us? And, yeah, a couple of months later we kind of negotiated and, yeah, we ended up taking the site, which was, yeah, which was kind of strange but... We we've always wanted to do uh, Chinese again because um, it's been it's been a long time and yeah so yeah it's just wanted to kind of revive Redfern a bit you know there's there's some up and coming restaurants in the area and we just wanted to add to it because it's such a diverse you know amazing area with a you know fantastic clientele. We're going to talk a little bit about sort of your history and the influence with Chinese cuisine, but 
Do you have some dishes that you can share, what, you know, from Redbird that sort of exemplifies what you're doing there? Yeah, I guess the, you know, the biggest one would be the namesake, which uh, Redbird is. Uh, so what we do, uh, we essentially rotate a, a poultry, uh, it could be duck, quail, chicken, squab, whatever we can get our hands on essentially from our suppliers. So that's a, it's a rotating uh, dish. Um, so it's it's done different ways, but uh, it's the crux of it is it's a red braise, so a classic Chinese red braise dish. So the the bird is poached in the red braise, uh, it, and then uh, deep fried, roasted. Uh, yeah, so it's a, a kind of a combination of what, whatever we come up with. Currently, the duck is probably the most popular at the moment, which uh, we get some beautiful ducks with the feet still on, so we red braise the legs, um, and then we also red braise, slightly red braise the uh, the breasts, uh, just so they're pink, and then we finish them on a charcoal grill and serve it with a, like a like a red braise jus, you could say. So it's kind of a cross between a, a, a classic uh, French style jus uh, with uh, some red braise sauce mixed in with that. Usually, usually with a you know a little salad uh, to cut through it. Uh, current one has a fennel, a fennel, a light fennel salad to go with it to cut through the richness of the duck. Do you find with the two restaurants that are quite different that um, you know you're, you're treating them quite differently? Do you, do they operate very differently? The two restaurants. Yeah, they do one hundred percent. Like uh, Tequila Daisy is a bit of a beast because it's a, you know it's a it's a high volume, high volume area. So you know we could do we could do three hundred four hundred covers uh, for lunch on a busy day, and then you know turn around and you know do another three hundred for dinner, for instance. So it's a it's a real high volume uh, place. Whereas Redbird is you know sit in for two hours, you know drink nice wine, take your meal slow. Uh, whereas you know we're doing kind of a hundred. Hundred, you know, plus covers on a busy Friday night or a Saturday night. So it's yeah, it's it's very very different. You briefly mentioned uh, Rebecca Lyons, who's um, your partner in in life and in the business. And I want to get into how you guys work together. Um, such a formidable team over so many different restaurants in Sydney. But take us back to when you were young. What, what sort of role did food play for you growing up? Um, both both my both my parents or both both families have kind of been in some kind of food uh, uh, way back. My my father's side, they were butchers in Adelaide. Uh, so my grandmother was an amazing cook and she, I always remember going to her house in Adelaide and eating her amazing pasties for lunch that she used to knock up, um, which was, you know, I, I still remember it and I've got pictures of uh, myself and my brother making, making pasties when we were kids, helping her out. Um, yeah, and they were just super amazing. And my mother's side uh, was also kind of in food. Uh, my gr- my my mother's father played cricket for Australia, um, so he 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 kind of played at Adelaide Oval. So he essentially grew up at Adelaide Oval in the in the box in the you know in the box with uh, sitting next to Don Bradman. I didn't I didn't really I didn't, actually didn't really really realise as a five year old kid. Sitting in a box with Don Bradman, you know, eating, drinking a coke, and eating peanuts, uh, and it was kind of yeah, the the peanuts side of it. We always used to eat peanuts in the box with Don Bradman and my grandfather. But my my grandfather, my sorry, my papa, his uh, his cousin Max um, used to sell nuts on the on the used to sell peanuts on the side on the on the on the sidelines at Adelaide Oval. And their their name their surname was Noblet, um, so everyone used to scream out, and, uh, "Hey, Nobby, bring over the nuts!" Hence, Nobby's nuts was born. So he was he was the inventor of Nobby, Nobby's nuts back in the day. <laughs> yeah. So there's yeah there's a few funny stories, but we always kind of you know we always grew up with food, and my mother's a fantastic cook, and she still cooks when she's down down in Sydney to visit us. So we've always kind of been around food. You know, when when I used to come home from school, there, there was always a tea cake or, or something like that ready ready for us for our afternoon tea and a full a full sit down dinner. Was a career in food something that you always thought about? Where did where did that begin? Uh, not really, I, yeah, to be honest. It was kind of you know I I didn't love school um, and I was kind of oh, what do I do? You know, do you, do you get a trade? Do you be an electrician? Do you be a plumber? You know, do you get into the hospitality industry? 
a couple of my mates were kind of toying up to kind of go in the hospitality route and then I was like, oh, yeah, that kind of that kind of might be good. That kind of sounds okay-ish. I wasn't kind of too sure. So I was, I was 16 and I, I wrote uh, probably – well, 30 to 50 letters to pretty much every every restaurant in Sydney at the time, uh, asking asking for an apprenticeship, because back then it wasn't you know it was kind of hard harder to get an apprenticeship. It wasn't it wasn't yeah. So I ended up yeah I ended up getting an apprenticeship at Baronia House, which is in Mossman back in the day, which was a, a kind of a it was a wedding venue plus plus a restaurant. So you know a big restaurant downstairs and a and a and a, a wedding venue upstairs, which is a beautiful heritage house. Which is which is still there actually, no longer a restaurant. What was it like for you, sort of, uh, you know, having grown up in Adelaide and moved to Sydney? Was it a different? Is it a hard change for you? Uh, oh, well, I, I was born in Mount Gambier, which is which is kind of near Adelaide, and we I literally moved to Sydney when I was about two, two or three. But we we used to go back every every single holidays to visit the grandparents. So I, I, yeah, I didn't actually grow up in Adelaide, so Sydney boy, you could say. Tell us about those first couple of years. Um, what was it like for you in commercial kitchens and sort of what were the real uh, important venues and people that you worked with? Uh, look, you know, I, I loved it as soon as I started at Brony House. I kind of went, yep, I'm going to do this. Um, and at the time it was just, uh, I think that restaurant was it was fantastic training because we just, we just you know, back in the day, we just made everything, you know, you, have, you had to do all the pastries, you had to do, make all the bread. Um, you had to do everything, so I, I really learned a lot of you know fantastic skills from that place, um, and I just kind of kept at it, and I became I became the head chef of that venue at nineteen. I finished my apprenticeship, and I kind of you know I just you know I was on larder, and I looked at the hot side guy, and I'm like, yep, I'm gonna I'm gonna do a better job than you, and I'm gonna take over your spot. So I got to his spot, and then I looked at the next spot, the sous chef guy, and I'm like, okay. I'm going to work harder and better than you and I'm going to take your job. So I kind of just literally worked my way up and the I can't remember the exact details, but the head chef ended up leaving and I, I was kind of so experienced in, in that place that they, they offered me the head chef role at 19. Wow. What was it like for you at 19, Were you, you know, thinking, looking back at it now? Um, yeah, it was, I mean, I was, I kind of foregoed a lot of friendships to be honest, cause I, you know, I was, I was just literally working, working my ass off and, and, and going down that ro- ro- road, where, whereas my friends were still kind of, you know, doing that HSC and finishing up, you know, and, and partying. And I was not really doing that. I was already a qualified chef and, and a head chef of a, a large venue. <laughs> so I kind of, I missed out on a bit of that to be honest, but yeah, I think, I think it was worth it in the end. As you built your career, um, who were the sort of really important people and venues um, as you got older after the Bar- baronial house? I mean, look, after after that, I kind of worked at a few places and then I ended up um, wanting to kind of change change a little bit. And I, I, I loved Asian food and um, I, I went for the job at Billy Kong in Crown Street when, when it first opened back in uh, when uh, – Kind of, I think it was two thousand. So I applied for that job, and I also applied for a job at Pier um, uh, with Stephen Hodges uh, back in the day and Grant King. So I got, I got both jobs literally on the same day. So I had to make a choice between the two. I was like, oh, what do I do? Because I, <laughs> I, I mean, I wanted to work at both because both would be amazing experiences um, in their own right. Uh, but I had to make a choice, obviously. Um, so yeah, one road led me this way, and the other road led me that way, and I ended up uh, starting at Billy Kwong, which I worked there for about nine years as head chef. Was it, it had a pretty profound uh, uh, impact on you? Take, take us into that kitchen and what it was like for you learning on the pans for the first time a new cuisine. Oh well, look, you know it was amazing. Like as I said, I really enjoyed Asian food in general, so it was kind of I was just lapping it up and and working with Kylie was an amazing experience. Um, just the knowledge that she had and working in a you know working on the walks for the first time was you know a totally different experience for me um, and for anyone really. And yeah, it was just it was just one of those venues that was just always bustling and always always busy and lines out the door and you know it was a real. A real kick to you know to work there it was yeah truly amazing. 
as a, as a diner, it was an amazing experience. And looking into that kitchen, which was so on show at the time, it had the most incredible alumni. Do you have any stories of some of the chefs that you worked with in there? Uh, I mean, look, when I when I worked there, you know, we had um, James Perry from Sixpenny was one of my chefs. Uh, Matt Lindsay from Esther was one of my chefs who we were standing next to. Uh, Otama Carey from Lankan Filling Station. Uh, Gemma, Gemma from uh, Ante. Um, so it was just, yeah, I mean, if you look back at it and there's all, all those guys are standing in one kitchen, you, you kind of, <laughs> extraordinary, you wouldn't, you wouldn't believe it. Um, and all the fantastic things that they've all gone on to do um, is just, yeah, is, yeah, is pretty special to be able to be part of that. Is, is there any dishes or techniques from that period of time that you can tell us about that had a really big impact on you? Uh, I think just mainly learning about um, Chinese food because it's, it's a real art in terms of uh, balancing dishes because uh, Chinese food is sweet, salty, sour. So having, having learned that and uh, wrapping your taste buds around that really, really uh, helps you in Western cuisine as well um, to balance you know, Western cuisine because usually – a Western dish is usually sour or salty. It's not really uh, all of those things combined. Um, and when I went to do Banksy, I kind of took that philosophy and really tried to make the dishes, you know, that, that kind of sweet, sour, salty, uh, com- and give them that complexity. You opened a highly successful restaurant in Surrey Hills with Rebecca called Bar H. Um, tell us about the beginnings of that and how you found the site and, and what it was like opening that up. Yeah, so Rebecca and I, or probably myself, always wanted to open a restaurant. Rebecca, not really. I kind of, she kind of got forced into it, um, but she was kind of like, I'll give you, I'll give you two years of my time and then we'll see how it goes. Um, but it came about uh, Kin, who was the floor manager at Billy Kwong, uh, uh, his partner, Keith, owned a cafe uh, in, in Surrey Hills uh, called The Wall. And yeah, he was yeah he was kind of looking to. They actually owned the building and renovated it from uh, ba- way back when. And he was kind of looking to sell it, get out. Um, and he was like, oh, you know, I know you're looking for a restaurant or a space. Uh, do you want it? And we were, we were umming and ahhing, but we kind of we both loved that part of um, Surrey Hills. It's just kind of feels a bit New Yorky, um, and we knew. It kind of had potential um, in terms of you know the people around there, very artistic fashion. So it kind of that drew us towards it. Um, yeah, and the, the rest is kind of history. We took it, we took the site. We kind of didn't have enough money. We started renovating it. Needed more money. We kind of, we found money. I don't know how, but we did. So we, we kind of got open. We got the doors open and finished it. And yeah, we yeah. And Bar H was born. Um, the first year was tough, but you know after that we kind of got got you know got got going. And yeah, the rest is history. Well, it was a, it was an amazing addition to that new wave of dining that was happening at the time, and was was quite unique with what you guys were doing. But you did change it a little bit along the way, and particularly your cooking and the cuisine that you were doing. Um, tell us a little bit about sort of what you were cooking at the beginning, and then you know sort of later on when you change things. Yeah, we started. I mean, we started off kind of more uh, European or well, Mediterranean uh, style food, um, and then. We ended up kind of going like I was like oh I just yeah I just want to cook uh, Asian food Chinese food again so we ended up changing it to across like a Chinese Japanese uh, style which I, I just I, you know we both love Japan and 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 China as well so it was just kind of one of those things that, you know I love cutting sashimi and I love presenting sashimi and all those kind of things that go with eating in Japan so we kind of fuse the two. You've done quite a few things since the Bar H days, um, most notably The Woods at the Four Seasons and obviously Banksy, which we sort of talked about as well. Tell, tell us about that period of time and what it was like going from such a small site like Bar H to dealing with a huge hotel group. Yeah, look, it was uh, they, they approached us through a mutual friend uh, and we just, Rebecca and I just, you know, we throw ourselves at anything uh, possible just to give it a go. Uh, if it works out, it works out. You know, if it 
it doesn't work out, then, you know, what a, what a great experience. So I think, yeah, we just kind of give it a go, essentially. Um, so, yeah, we, we signed on to the woods. Um, and I just thought it would be an amazing experience to open a, open a restaurant in a hotel because most restaurants in hotels around the world are kind of, you know, pretty amazing. And Australia doesn't really do them that well. Uh, we don't really have a lot. Um, so yeah, it was one of those things. I'm like, yeah, we've got to we've got to do this. Uh, so we had the restaurant, uh, also grain bar, which we had to do food for, and also uh, I was uh, had to do room service for I think it's three four hundred rooms upstairs. So it was just yeah, it was just one of those things, a challenge <laughs> that a bit of a beast of a challenge that we just thought would would yeah would go for it. Um, what did you take from that experience? Um, look, just in terms of working working with a hotel and you know working that in that environment it's yeah the management skills that you gain and all of that is 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 truly amazing just to be able to manage that many people and that many different kind of venues going going at the same time was you know invaluable really the, the last couple of years have um been an upheaval for everyone but how do you approach things do you approach things differently with your businesses sort of since uh, the pandemic yeah, look, we're I guess you know everyone's kind of on their toes now. Like we don't know, we never know what's going around the corner, um, and we we take each day as it comes, each week as it comes, each month as it comes, each year as it comes, and that you you know before it was a lot more consistent. Uh, before COVID, we kind of knew what was happening. You know, Christmas is you know that period's going to be super busy. We're you know going to get through that, and we know winter's going to be. A little bit dire uh, generally, um, so you know, tighten the belts. Um, but I guess now it's it's a lot harder to predict. Like we, it's kind of the case where you know one week can be amazing and then the next week kind of is down, and you just don't know what you just don't know what's happening. So you kind of have to take each day, each week, each month as it comes. So it's it, it's a lot trickier now. We've had uh, Rebecca Lyons on the show, which feels like many moons ago, um, but you're both uh, together, one of the most dynamic duos in the industry. Tell us a little bit about how you guys work together. Look, I mean, we, we actually met at Billy Kwong, um, and I think we work really well together. We're, we're, we're very different, uh, and having me in the kitchen and Rebecca on the front of house, uh, it, it works really well. We have a fantastic working relationship. I mean, we've been doing it for so long together and had two kids, had multiple businesses, and we're, we're still together doing it. Um, and, yeah, which is pretty amazing, I think. But we, yeah, we just complement each other. Um, Rebecca's fantastic at doing, you know, some things, and I'm better at doing other things. So we kind of always just have that have that complementing uh, working together. What's it been like for you delving back into the world of Chinese food? Um, yeah, I love it. Like, I'm really enjoying it. I think it's it's something I really love and I really enjoy doing. Um, and I think, you know, I think it's it's a, it's a one of my great passions in uh, cooking Chinese food. Um, just the flavours and the style of cooking and the energy uh, from the wok. Yeah, it's just, you know, I, I love it. And I think it's it's kind of my thing and I'm, you know, I'm, I reckon I'm not too bad at it. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, it's just super enjoyable for me. It's, uh, it's starting to warm up at the moment and the ingredients are changing. What, 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 what sort of impact is that going to have on your menu there at Redbird? Do you have some idea of what what's going to happen this spring and summer on the menu? Um, yeah, look, at the moment we, we're, we're really trying to change, change the menu monthly. So we started, we started that probably two, two or three months ago. Uh, we don't change the whole menu, but we kind of pick and choose. We take three or four dishes off, put three or four more on. We keep the kind of one that is selling well and kind of doing, is doing well in sales. Um, but we, yeah. So we we look to the suppliers and see what's coming up. You know, what's what's in October. What what fruit and veg is special, and what can we what can we use? So you know, we don't have to keep that dish on for a long time. So we we try and really hard to get the produce that's coming in. Uh, you know, the nice beautiful spring asparagus and things like that. 
uh, lamb, you know, any, anything that's kind of coming in. We don't have to keep it for a long time. We can play with it for a month and then, you know, get rid of it and what else is coming uh, that we can use that's going to be around for a month. So we're kind of doing shorter menu changes and using the, the produce that's in season and available now at, at its best, which is, which is nice for the chefs as well because it's more enjoyable to change, change the menu up every, every month. Red fern's very different to what it was a ten or fifteen years ago. What what do you love about um, the suburb and what's going on with food there? Uh, just uh, red fern. I've, we've always loved red fern, Surrey Hills, but red fern since moving here, it's kind of it's a very dynamic and the crowd, the the different types of people, and uh, it's it's still got its little bit of grunge, uh, you know, and then it's got its. You know, higher end, higher end people. It's it's very very diverse, and I think it's just it's still got its little arty sections and the food scene. You know, we've got Fontana down the road, which is amazing. Uh, you've got us. You know, you've got Bart Junior. We just need need a few more little things, and I think there's a lot more uh, quality businesses coming into the area. I um, mean, it is changing definitely, like compared to what it was you know years ago, but. I think you know it's such a close suburb to the city that it, you know it's it's bound to change and it's yeah it's time. Well, you're always one to try a new challenge and throw yourself in the deep end. Um, you've got the two restaurants at the moment. Is there anything else on the horizon that you can share with us? Uh, not at the moment. No, <laughs> that's <laughs> surprising. Just, yeah, not at the moment, but yes, yeah, which is which is surprising. Which probably you know if you talk to me tomorrow, then I probably would. There'll be something that pops up. Um, Rebecca will have some harebrained scheme or idea, and yeah, then we'll we'll be going for it. So I never know what we're doing next. So you know, tomorrow, in a week's time, in a month's time, there'll be something else. I know it. Um, and we we usually we're the, we're the kind of people that just roll with it, and we're like, yep, let's do it. Do we have any money? No, nope. we'll find some. So <laughs> yeah, we're very resourceful. Well, you're both always delivering something unique and a a little bit uh, special to Sydney, and you've done that over the last sort of 10 or 15 years. Um, What do you love about what you do? Uh, You know, we both, both, me in particular, or both of us love creating, Uh, you know, to create a restaurant and have, have the initial idea and, you know, Work with work with the designers. Work with the graphic designers. You know, uh, coming up with logos and coming up with the names and coming up with menus and wine lists. It, uh, it, that's uh, I think that for us or for me, it's the best part of it. Is just is that creation, uh, creating something new and you know, creating something new to fit in the in the environment where you are. Well, Hamish, um, it took a little while, and a bit of arm twisting, but it's an absolute honour to get you on Deep in the Weeds today to hear just a part of your story. Um, please keep in touch and uh, we'll have to catch up again soon. Thank you very much and it was a pleasure. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we take a deep dive into the lives of the incredible people who ply their trade in the food and hospitality sector. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well. <laughs>